Hey everyone, in our last video, we explained the basics of CFD and the different steps involved in it. We also promised to upload a tutorial on how to do a CFD simulation using ANSYS Fluent. Okay, so like we told you, CFD can be used to simulate a wide range of uh, fluid flow problems. But for this example, we're going to use the classical example of a NACA 0012 airfoil. We're using this example because there is already a lot of information and data available for the NACA 0012 airfoil which we can use to validate our simulation with. In this video, we're only going to simulate the 2D flow around the airfoil. But if you want to simulate the 3D flow, it's not too different, except for the extra added dimension. The airfoil, which has a chord of 25 centimeters, is simulated at a speed of 75 meters per second. This translates to a speed of about 300 kilometers per hour and the airfoil is set at an angle of attack of 0 degrees. These speeds are usually encountered in a lot of motorsports like Formula 1. Hi, I'm Nikhilesh. And I'm Kushal. We are the two... Uh, uh, uh. Today, we have a special guest with us, who is our classmate and also very good at CFD. Introducing Nikhil Mahalingesh. Hey everyone, I'm Nikhil. I'm a fellow Broke scientist. Today I'm here to explain what is CFD and help out a few of my friends who are also Broke scientists. Before we start off with any CFD simulation, the first thing we need to consider is Reynolds number. The Reynolds number in this case was calculated to be around 1 million. So what does this Reynolds number value mean? It means that the flow is completely turbulent in the whole domain. Also, since this is a symmetrical airfoil, we cannot expect any kind of lift values. But there will also be drag values and we can validate this drag with experimental values. Now that we know how the flow will behave, we can go ahead with the meshing process. Before we start with the meshing process, we need to define where the boundaries of the mesh should lie. Why is this important? This is because there might be boundary effects which will affect your forces. As a rule of thumb, the boundary of the mesh should be placed 10 length scales away from your geometry. Okay guys, so as we told you, we're going to do this simulation in ANSYS Fluent. And we've opened a workbench. And on the left, you see all the different types of modules in Workbench. I've opened up a Fluent. And in Fluent, you see clearly the steps are demarcated. You have geometry, mesh, setup, solution, and results. This kind of ordering makes it very easy to choose what you want to do and this in the order which you want to do it in. So first, let's go into geometry. Okay, now we've entered the geometry creation window. So the first thing you do here is you actually create the geometry that you need. You can either create the geometry or import your uh, airfoil. And in this case, we have imported the airfoil. And you can also notice that there is the scale right below here to mention, to give you an idea of what the chord of the airfoil is. So once you're done with this, you go about uh, creating the domain for the airfoil. So there are different types of domain you can create, like for example, a rectangular domain or a C domain. For the case of an airfoil, we've decided to make it the domain in the shape of a C because it uh, makes sure that the mesh is uh, really well defined for the leading edge. And as Nikhil mentioned, uh, we have to make sure that the distance from the airfoil is about 10 chords. So we make sure that the domain is uh, spaced at about a distance of 10 chords. And for a detailed understanding of how to do each of these steps, there are a lot of tutorials online that you can watch. Next, we have to choose the type of element in your mesh. This will decide whether your mesh is structured or unstructured. Alright, so now that we are done with the geometry creation, we have to go to the next step, which is meshing. Now, Fluent already has its own meshing software, but a lot of people feel that it doesn't offer a lot of flexibility and control. So, even for this tutorial, we have chosen to do the final mesh in another software of Workbench called ISMCFD. But we'll still show you a few of the tips and tricks that Nichols mentions using Fluent's own software. The mesh can either be made structured or unstructured. In the case of a 2D geometry, a structured mesh is dominated by quadrilateral elements, whereas an unstructured mesh is dominated by triangular elements. The mesh shown here is unstructured. As you can see, it is dominated by triangular elements, whereas the structured mesh that we have created has regular elements, which are predominantly quadrilateral or rectangles in nature. Next, we have to decide the size of your elements. This is decided by something called as Y+. Plus. Y+, plus is a non-dimensional wall normal distance, or in simple words, is the height of the first cell next to your airfoil surface. 
This is important because Y plus determines the accuracy of your boundary layer capture. And this in turn determines the accuracy of your forces. The rule of thumb for calculating Y plus is to be as low as possible. How low should be Y plus? Ideally, it should be around 1. This means that your boundary layer is accurately captured. But this also means that the number of elements in your mesh is very high. This will also result in your computational time being very very long. In practice, it is very difficult to achieve Y plus around 1. And also, not everyone will have the computational resources to do such simulations. The other option is to have a Y plus between 30 and 300. This means that your boundary layer is not resolved, but in this case, we use wall functions. So, when you don't have a Y plus around 1, you are essentially losing information in the boundary layer. This information is captured using wall functions. So in fluid dynamics, the average velocity of a turbulent flow in the boundary layer behaves universally. And this, this is what wall functions model. But this does not mean wall functions can be used in all cases, as it is not valid in complex cases where you have flow separation. So now that we have chosen a desired Y+, plus, how do I calculate the first cell height next to my airfoil surface? You can do this by using many online calculators that is easily found, where you just input your flow parameters and your desired Y+, plus, and it will give you the first cell height of your mesh. Once the mesh is generated, the quality of the mesh has to be determined. Orthogonality is one of the quality checks that has to be performed every time. This has to be as close to 1 as possible. The next thing is the skewness of the mesh. This has to be as low as possible. The minimum volume of your mesh should be greater than 0. And also, the aspect ratio of your mesh should be as low as possible. Next, we have to choose a type of turbulence modeling. In this simulation, we will be using a RANS model or Reynolds Average Navier-Stokes model. There are different types of RANS models available such as spalar alarms, K epsilon, K omega, shear stress transport and Reynolds stress models. In our case, we will be using spalar alarms models because it is best suited for external aerodynamics, it has been validated for aerospace applications and also works well specifically for turbulent boundary layers under adverse pressure gradients. Now you have to decide whether you want to do a steady simulation or a transient simulation. This has to be decided based on your flow behavior. Whether you want to accurately capture the time evolution of flow structures in your domain or not. Now you also have to decide if you want to do a compressible or an incompressible simulation. This is decided by the Mach number of your flow. Mach number is the ratio of the speed of your flow divided by the speed of sound. And if your Mach number is less than 0.3, it is considered as an incompressible flow and if it is greater than 0.3 it is considered as compressible flows. Now you also have to choose numerical schemes for your solver. Numerical schemes convert partial derivatives to linear algebraic equations. Numerical schemes are of different orders or accuracy types. So higher order schemes are more accurate but they are also very oscillatory in behavior. That is they need more number of elements to behave in a perfect manner. Therefore, you have to find the right amount of balance between number of elements and the order of your numerical scheme. Now, you also have to choose your residual tolerance. In short, this determines the precision of your CFT results. This should be as low as possible. As a rule of thumb, see that residual tolerance should be kept as low as 10 power minus 6. Now that all parts of your CFT simulation is set up, you can start your simulation now. And while your simulation is running, there are certain things to observe while the simulation happens, such as the evolution of your residuals and the evolution of your forces. So this residuals, as your iteration goes on, should keep on decreasing. And if it starts increasing, then you should stop the simulation because the solution has, will start diverging. And you should only stop your simulation once the forces in your domain have reached a constant value. Okay, now we're into the actual solving phase of Fluent. Here, first, uh, you can check the mesh quality and the parameters which Nikhil was mentioning. You also have the option of choosing a pressure-based or a density-based solver. Pressure-based is usually preferred for an incompressible type of flow. And you also have the choice of steady or transient type of problem. Here, we're choosing steady because we're not interested in the time evolution of the flow behavior. The next step is to choose the model. So the turbulence model is 
the one of the most important parameters in your CFD simulation. And as we said, we're going to be using the spallet almaras equation. There are different options you can choose for which work for different situations. Then you can choose your materials, which you probably could also set before in your meshing. After you choose your materials, you can go to the boundary conditions. The boundary conditions are important because they obviously determine what kind of uh, solution you are going to get. Here we have set the velocity to be 75 meter per second at the inlet and flowing in the x direction. And the turbulence viscosity ratio, which is a parameter associated with the spallet almonas equation, can be uh, verified online, similar to the y plus. The other boundaries also have to be set very carefully because if you don't set your boundary conditions right, your solution might diverge. You have the pressure outlet and the airfoil itself, which is a no slip wall. After you set the boundary conditions, you can go to the solution methods. The solution methods determine the type of solution algorithm uh, that you choose and also the special discretization as Nikhil was alluding to earlier. You have first order, second order, even higher, higher order schemes. You can play around with these to check how they affect the convergence of your solution. The under relaxation factors basically determine how your solution progresses from one iteration to the next. And having lower uh, under relaxation factor helps your uh, solution converge better. Finally, you can choose your residuals, which is uh, the tolerances the tolerances for your residuals. A 10 power minus 4 is considered as an acceptable engineering solution, although 10 power minus 6 is a good solution. And you also monitor your lift and drag residuals. So once you've set up everything, you can go to solution initialization. And you basically, this means that you initialize the solution in your domain to a one value. And once this is done, your solution is set and you finally go to solve. While you're solving, you observe the residuals of the problem and make sure that they converge and don't diverge. And once your force residuals uh, have attained a steady state, you know that the solution is not changing with time and you have at least a converged solution. Finally, now we have a converged solution and you see that the, all the residuals are at least 10 power minus 4 or 5 and below, which is good. Now that your CFD simulation has finished, you can do your post processing. The first thing that has to be done is to verify whether continuity is conserved in your CFD results. Now after you have verified the validity of your CFD results, the beauty of CFD is that you, are, you can obtain velocity and pressure data at all points in your domain, using which you can obtain contours, isosurfaces, animations of all kinds of data throughout the whole domain. Finally, you can visualize the forces in your domain, such as lift and drag. These can be converted to non-dimensional quantities such as lift coefficient and drag coefficient, using which it can be validated by experimental values. Thanks for watching. We hope you enjoyed the video. Hopefully you now know how to do a CFD simulation. If you have any questions, don't forget to leave a comment below or don't forget to contact Nikhil whose details we'll leave in the description below. And finally, don't forget to like, share and subscribe. Bye! Bye.